Why did the United States attack Libya, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Yemen? Why are U.S. operatives helping to destabilize Syria? And why is the United States government so intent on taking down Iran, in spite of the fact that Iran has not attacked any country since 1798? And what's next? What are we headed for? When you look at the current trajectory that we're on, it doesn't make any sense at all if you evaluate it based on what we're taught in school. And it doesn't make any sense if you base your worldview on the propaganda that the mainstream media tries to pass off as news. But it makes perfect sense once you know the real motives of the powers that be. In order to understand those motives, we first have to take a look at history. In 1945, the Bretton Woods Agreement established the dollar as the world reserve currency, which meant that international commodities were priced in dollars. The agreement, which gave the United States a distinct financial advantage, was made under the condition that those dollars would remain redeemable for gold at a consistent rate of $35 per ounce. The United States promised not to print very much money, but this was on the honor system, because the Federal Reserve refused to allow any audits or supervision of its printing presses. In the years leading up to 1970, expenditures in the Vietnam War made it clear to many countries that the U.S. was printing far more money than it had in gold. And in response, they began to ask for their gold back. This, of course, set off a rapid decline in the value of the dollar. The situation climaxed in 1971 when France attempted to withdraw its gold and Nixon refused. On August 15th, he made the following announcement. I have directed the Secretary of the Treasury to take the action necessary to defend the dollar against the speculators. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. The United States. This was obviously not a temporary suspension, as he claimed, but rather a permanent default. And for the rest of the world who had entrusted the United States with their gold, it was outright theft. In 1973, President Nixon asked King Faisal of Saudi Arabia to accept only U.S. dollars as payment for oil and to invest any excess profits in U.S. Treasury bonds, notes, and bills. In return, Nixon offered military protection for Saudi oil fields. The same offer was extended to each of the world's key oil-producing countries, and by 1975, every member of OPEC had agreed to only sell their oil in U.S. dollars. The act of moving the dollar off of gold and tying it to foreign oil instantly forced every oil importing country in the world to start maintaining a constant supply of Federal Reserve paper. And in order to get that paper, they would have to send real physical goods to America. This was the birth of the petrodollar. Paper went out, everything America needed came in, and the United States got very, very rich as a result. It was the largest financial con in recorded history. The arms race of the Cold War was a game of poker. Military expenditures were the chips, and the U.S. had an endless supply of chips. With the petrodollar under its belt, it was able to raise the stakes higher and higher, outspending every other country on the planet, until eventually U.S. military expenditures surpassed that of all other nations in the world combined. The Soviet Union never had a chance. The collapse of the communist bloc in 1991 removed the last counterbalance to American military might. The United States was now an undisputed superpower with no rival. Many hoped that this would mark the beginning of a new era of peace and stability. Unfortunately, there were those in high places who had other ideas. Within that same year, the U.S. invaded Iraq in the first Gulf War. And after crushing the Iraqi military, and destroying their infrastructure, including water purification plants and hospitals, crippling sanctions were imposed which prevented that infrastructure from being rebuilt. These sanctions, which were initiated by Bush Sr. and sustained throughout the entire Clinton administration, lasted for over a decade and were estimated to have killed over 500,000 children. The Clinton administration was fully aware of these figures. We have heard that half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth, worth it. Miss Albright, what exactly was it that was worth killing 500,000 kids for? 
In November of 2000, Iraq began selling its oil exclusively in euros. This was a direct attack on the dollar and on U.S. financial dominance, and it wasn't going to be tolerated. In response, the U.S. government, with the assistance of the mainstream media, began to build up a massive propaganda campaign claiming that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction and was planning to use them. In 2003, the U.S. invaded, and once they had control of the country, oil sales were immediately switched back to dollars. This is particularly notable due to the fact that switching back to the dollar meant a 15 to 20 percent loss in revenue due to the euro's higher value. It doesn't make any sense at all unless you take the petrodollar into account. So I came back to see him a few weeks later, and by that time we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, he said, I just... He said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. 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 Let's take a look at the events of the past decade and see if you see a pattern. In Libya, Gaddafi was in the process of organizing a block of African countries to create a gold-based currency called the dinar which they intended to use to replace the dollar in that region. U.S. and NATO forces helped destabilize and topple the Libyan government in 2011, and after taking control of the region, U.S. armed rebels executed Gaddafi in cold blood and immediately set up the Libyan Central Bank. Iran has been actively campaigning to pull oil sales off of the dollar for some time now, and it has recently secured agreements to begin trading its oil in exchange for gold. In response, the U.S. government, with mainstream media assistance, has been attempting to build international support for military strikes on the pretext of preventing Iran from building a nuclear weapon. In the meantime, they established sanctions which U.S. officials openly admit are aimed at causing a collapse of the Iranian economy. Syria is Iran's closest ally, and they are bound by mutual defense agreements. The country is currently in the process of being destabilized with covert assistance from NATO. And though Russia and China have warned the United States not to get involved, the White House has made statements within the past month indicating that they are considering military intervention. It should be clear that military intervention in Syria and Iran isn't being considered. It's a foregone conclusion, just as it was in Iraq and Libya. The U.S. is actively working to create the context which gives them the diplomatic cover to do what they already have planned. The motive for these invasions and covert actions becomes clear when we look at them in their full context and connect the dots. Those who control the United States understand that even if a few countries begin to sell their oil in another currency, it will set off a chain reaction and the dollar will collapse. They understand that there is absolutely nothing else holding up the value of the dollar at this point, and so does the rest of the world. But rather than accepting the fact that the dollar is nearing the end of its lifespan, the powers that be have made a calculated gambit. They have decided to use the brute force of the U.S. military to crush each and every resistant state in the Middle East and Africa. That in itself would be bad enough, but what you need to understand is that this is not going to end with Iran. China and Russia have stated publicly and on no uncertain terms that they will not tolerate an attack on Iran or Syria. Iran is one of their key allies, one of the last independent oil producers in the region. And they understand that if Iran falls, then they will have no way to escape the dollar without going to war. And yet the United States is pushing forward in spite of the warnings. What we are witnessing here is a trajectory that leads straight to the unthinkable. It's a trajectory that was mapped out years ago in full awareness of the human consequences. But who was it that put us on this course? What kind of psychopath is willing to intentionally set off a global conflict that will lead to millions of deaths just to protect the value of a paper currency? It obviously isn't the president. The decision to invade Libya, Syria, and Iran was made long before Obama had risen to the national spotlight. And yet, he's carrying out his duty just like the puppets that preceded him. So who is it that pulls the strings? Often the best answer to questions like this are found by asking another question. Qui bono? Who benefits? Obviously those who have the power to print the dollar out of thin air have the most to lose if the dollar were to fall. And since 1913, that power has been held by the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is a private entity owned by a conglomerate of the most powerful banks in the world. And the men who control those banks are the ones who pull the strings. To them, this is just a game. Your life and the lives of those you love are just pawns on their chessboard. And like a spoiled four-year-old who tips the board onto the floor when they start to lose, the powers that be are willing to start World War III to keep control of the global financial system. 
Remember that when these wars extend and accelerate. Remember that when your son or your neighbor's son comes back home in a flag-draped coffin. Remember that when they point the finger at the new boogeyman. Because the madmen who are running this show will take this as far as you allow them to. So how much time do we have left? It's a question I hear constantly, but it's the wrong question. Asking how much time we have left is a passive posture. It's the attitude of a prisoner who's waiting to be taken out to a ditch and shot in the back of the head. What are our chances? Can we change course? Also the wrong question. The odds don't matter anymore. If you understand what we're facing, then you have a moral responsibility to do everything in your power to alter the course that we're on, regardless of the odds. It's only when you stop basing your involvement on the chances of success that success actually becomes possible. To strip the ill-begotten power from the financial elites and to bring these criminal cartels to justice will require nothing less than a revolution. The government is not going to save us. The government is completely infiltrated and corrupts the core. Looking to them for a solution at this point is utterly naive. There are three stages of revolution, and they are sequential. Stage one is already underway. Stage one is the ideological resistance. In this stage, we have to actively work to wake up as many people as possible about what is happening and the direction we're headed. All revolutions originate from a shift in the mindset of the population, and no other meaningful resistance is possible without it. Success in this stage of the game can be measured by the contagion of ideas. When an idea reaches critical mass, it begins to spread on its own and seeps into all levels of society. In order to achieve that contagion, we need more people in this fight. We need more people speaking out, making videos, writing articles, getting this information onto the national and international stage. And we especially need to reach the police and the military. Stage two is civil disobedience also known as nonviolent resistance. In this stage, you put your money where your mouth is, or more accurately, you withhold your money and your obedience from the government, and you do everything in your power to bring the gears of the state to a halt. Practiced in mass, this method alone is often enough to bring a regime to its knees. However, if you fail at this stage, stage three is inevitable. Stage three is direct physical resistance. Direct physical resistance is the last resort and it should be avoided and delayed as long as possible. And it should only be invoked after all other options have been thoroughly exhausted. There are those who talk tough and claim that they will resist when the time comes. But what those people fail to realize is that if you are inactive during the first two stages and save your efforts for the last resistance, then you will fail. When the Nazis were moving door to door, dragging people out of their homes in Germany, that was the time to fight back physically. But due to the lack of ideological resistance and civil disobedience leading up to that moment, even an armed uprising would have likely failed at that point. An armed uprising can only succeed if the people have established an attitude of active resistance. And active resistance is only possible after their minds have broken free from the mainstream propaganda. If you want to fight back, it's now or never. You're not going to get another chance, and the stakes are far higher than they were in Nazi Germany.